So Lisa, so think, what would you like to talk about? Oh my gosh, I have no idea. I mean, <laughs> well, so just... first let's do the thing where we introduce. We are we are we are not great at doing this in a formal way. In fact, you know, I'm going to turn on my light because there's just enough light now, but the sun will be it won't be later setting. So rather yeah. than go through that, yeah. So think about how you want to introduce yourself. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this is our guest, Lisa Parker. She likes to whisper <laughs> when Everybody, she talks about herself. Anybody that watches this and hears that will guffaw at the notion <laughs> that I would whisper about anything. She's a whisperer, so we have to listen very carefully. So Lisa, yeah, introduce yourself, please. I know you as this amazing person who has worked with behind the scenes with lots of uh, interesting operational stuff, and that's kind of all I know. So can you fill in the blanks a little? Sure. So I've been in the Intel community for a little over 20 years. Uh, I'm a, I have a master's of fine arts in creative writing. I'm a poet with a couple of books out and never intended to come into the defense sector. Um, but I lived in New York City during 9-11 and I was a first responder down there in those first few days. I'd been a medic for about 15 years. I wasn't a paid medic in New York, um, but obviously went down there as soon as that happened. And um, yeah, I just thought, okay, I want to do something to, you know, try to keep this from happening again. And I knew, I thought I was probably too old and out of shape for the military. So my dad had worked um, SIGINT, he was an army guy. And so he just made the suggestion, you know, what about the DOD? And and then I ended up, you know, that chick that was starting at the NRO, whose last job was the Metropolitan Opera. So it was a bit of a whiplash, but a great community. And uh, I've been doing different levels of operational support, um, tactical support, a lot of counterinsurgency stuff, um, special forces support, things like that. And, and standard conventional, you know, broader DOD support. So my biggest thing was working as a um, operational national intelligence um, facilitator to try and we're very bad in the IC about bridging that DOD um, gap. You know, they're mostly on the SIPR on the secret side and we're on the TS side and it's a, it's just a, not a great bridge. And so I did a lot of work with a small team of people who were certified by ODNI to bridge that and to do crisis surge support when we'd have, you know, thousands of people suddenly showing up in real time chat spaces. And so I did those for a long time. I was the operational pit boss for a joint collaboration cell between NRO and NGA, which was the best job ever. I'll never top that job. So mm. yeah, it was great. And that's how I came to know Carmen's name. Um, somebody had mentioned her and mentioned, um, you need to read this book about the rebels at work. You've got to read this. And and so I looked at that and I was like, oh my God, like my my people, this was, and it was really great as a woman to read this. And I, I did, I would inscribe it and give it to every badass woman that I worked with. <laughs> like you guys need to read this. So, and that was- it's interesting you say that Lisa, because one of the concerns I had when the, we were writing the book was that it people might think it was written from a woman's perspective or that the fact that both Lewis and I were women couldn't help but color our mm -hmm. perspective and our professional experiences. Yeah. And I did hear from a couple of men uh, who read it, who, uh, you know, as friends of the court, not as, <laughs> right. um, you know, hostile in any way, but saying, yeah, you know, there are some things you suggest that I just can't imagine that I or any other guy would do. And I wonder, since you're in this collaboration space and you're working these issues, um, on the ground, what do you think about that? I mean, I think it's I think it's interesting. Um, I mean, I think part of what resonated with me in seeing that was that here's this, you know, this powerful woman who's held this very powerful position, but was not afraid to be a truth teller. Was it, it was more for me about that moral compass and about understanding that at the heart of it, what this game is about is staying left of whatever the disaster is and that you're only going to do that if you're if you're acting in good faith and telling the truth and telling the truth up the chain and telling the truth 
um, to power is a really hard thing. So hearing that coming from someone who had been in that position of power, that was the thing for me. The fact that you were a woman was doubly awesome. But the I think, and and I'm sure that <laughs> I'm sure that I shouldn't say this out loud, but I oh, have yeah, found, whisper it. Then yeah, it's I'm not like, really like you said it. So just between us. So uh, my experience in the DOD of being grossly outnumbered as women um, is that the people who the the men who are in these positions um, of authority and title and power are rarely the ones that will tell an uncomfortable truth to another man. And that when I'm in a situation where that uncomfortable truth is something that I am professing or I need support on, um, I give that pretty, pretty low odds that that's going to happen. And so one of the things that I was interested in in looking at this was the notion that rebels are, you know, I love that you made a distinction between good rebels and bad rebels, because as a woman, I got categorized because I was very passionate, especially warfighter support in military counterinsurgency ops. I really did not have a lot of patience for the bullshit. So if someone was trying to make a political decision that had some adverse impact on ops that we were doing, I had just zero tolerance. And I've been a contractor all 20 years. So I had no power. I had I had some influence, but no power. And so I realized I was getting couched instead of as a truth teller or instead of as someone who wasn't afraid to speak the truth or even a good rebel i was being couched you know cutely as a table flipper and i thought why is that being attributed to me in this manner that i don't hear that attributed wait help to me men? understand table flipper like someone that is going to charge the room the reason i'm going to get something done is because i'm going to charge the room and flip the flip, table you know grenade thrower table oh well, exactly. well, isn't that what jesus did when jesus went into the temple i mean is that what we're talking <laughs> right, about right okay. <laughs> yeah so i mean and i always nobody said that to me as a as a you know it wasn't meant as they meant it as a hey buddy you know you're the one we send in there to mess it up to go in there and shake them up a little but i just thought how, why is that consistently women in my experience and there were some men that certainly did not fit that certainly there were some that would go in there and just say nah we're not doing it that way mm -hmm. um and it didn't matter how uncomfortable but most of the rebels that i saw doing that uncomfortable thing were women and so i found that's why i think i found that doubly fascinating that that it was two women that wrote that book yeah you know yeah i, I, I can tell this conversation is going to go in so many ways but First, I have to acknowledge the stuffies behind you, uh, Julia. So, yeah. Yeah. your microphone. Yep. Yeah. So this is um, I'm at my mom's house, um, sort of doing some some caregiving and some hanging out before the holidays. And uh, they have these little stuffies around, and there's a monkey and a dog, and they're wonderful. Very nice. <laughs> I love it. I have a question, uh, Lisa. Um, this is fascinating to me. I hadn't heard about this turning tables idea. Turning tables in particular. Flipping. Flipping, flipping tables. Flipping. But, flip, but it's, okay, flipping tables. But the image I have is of someone who's coming, like literally the first thing I thought of was Jesus, right? And I'm a Jew, but you know, he's very Jewish. He goes into the temple. In he's, fact. In fact, very Jewish. And he goes oh, into so the- So was Jesus. <laughs> and he goes into the temple and- he doesn't like what he sees and he changes it. And he mm -hmm. says, it's basically a, a is saying, I'm not going to fit into that. Like, I'm not part of this system. Like, sorry, I'm not part of this system. And I think that's why it's seen as so disruptive. And it occurred to me that um, if you're part of the system, if you're mostly working a mostly male organization, which all three of us have, um, the system that that men are on average comfortable with is totally defensible because in their view, that's what makes them feel comfortable, um, which is this sort of like alpha dog system, right? Like, you know, the chain of command and you know who gets to say what and, and it, don't rock the boat because that's going to make everyone uncomfortable because then we think we don't know the chain of command. Yes. Right. But then you come in there and you're like, oh, I don't give a flying F about the chain of command because this is the right thing to do. We have to get going. They're like, ah, are you in charge? What's happening, right? And it's totally innocent. Well, I like think- it, in, a, in a certain way, it's like, 
they're responding in a way that's reasonable to them, which might be like, you're, you're confusing the system. Well, I think too, and I mean, Carmen can probably speak to this a lot more having in, in that echelon of, of dealing, I, I can't even fathom. We're talking at the like ground, ground level um, of dealing with that. But I, I think part of that is that the system it's familiar because it's a system that they built. And I don't, I don't mean that even in a, I don't mean that in anything other than fact. Like, factual, factual. Yes. Yeah. And it, and it makes, and it makes sense to them and the way, and, and to be clear, um, I never did it out of uh, a sense that there, you know, there was, no, there was no um, playing innocent about what I was doing, but I also fully appreciated the hierarchy and always used the hierarchy. I never would jump over somebody because mm. number one, it just, it, it takes away, it's a detracting thing. You show up on the scene and you've already taken a hit because you did a thing you shouldn't. I also worked generally with people younger than me. They were officers who were captains, first lieutenants. They were much younger. I never, ever wanted to put them in a bad position. But once I had said, this is not acceptable for this reason, and here's the risk, and we're not going to incur it. 101st Airborne is going to incur this, or these SEALs are going to incur this. So that's unacceptable. So what are we going to do? And if they if that didn't motivate them enough, then always that 05 or 06 was around the corner. And 06, uh, Julia is a colonel. I'm in sorry. Military, right. So got it. Thank you. Right. The highest right. rank before you become a general. Right. So those got are it. the people that would say, hey, what's going on? And they would generally ask me as both an ops pit boss, the oldest one there, the more experienced one there, but also because I would give a ground truth. And so I had a captain say to me once, you know, there are consequences when you have these conversations with, with these senior people. And I said, yes, there are. Let's, are you, is this a problem with me or is this a, why aren't they coming to you for that? Let's talk about that for a second. They're not coming to you because you don't tell the truth because you know, that's not what they want to hear. So, you know, I, and then I always, it was a hard balance of not coming off like a condescending, you know, asshole or a, like a, like I was coming off, like, listen here, junior. And I, I never, it was a hard balance to strike to mentor, but also not having the time for them to catch on and do the right thing when we're prosecuting war on two fronts. I was so like, uh, but Lisa, now I'm so unclear. What is table flipping? Like, I think this is key, like the perception of it versus the actual reality of what you're talking about. Because what you're talking about seems totally reasonable, especially in an environment where people's lives are at risk and you, you have to have ground truth or you've got nothing, right? So that's 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 what that's what you're talking about. I am. What is I'll this perception of it? Like- what is that? How is it perceived? I, I think part of this, and I don't, you know, I don't want to speak for everybody. It's my own experience was it's, it's hard. It, the bottom line is you show up to do a job every day and it's not a banker job, but it's a job. It's a job you show up to each and every day. That's confined. You know, it has a hard left and right boundary. It has a hierarchy. It has rules. It has, we're going to do this this week. And when part of that doesn't fit because the people making decisions at the top are so removed from what is happening at the ground level and the people that should be conveying that either don't have the experience to do it or are too afraid to say that thing you want to do is messing up this thing on the ground, that's when you get this disparity. And that that disparity is really, you have to have somebody either a little more senior or someone on a afraid to buck the system a little bit or unafraid to tell somebody a hard truth. And then there are those leaders that don't want to hear it. There are plenty of leaders. And I'm sure Carmen has probably dealt with a lot more of that than I have, who, who just flat say, this is what we're doing press. Like this is what we're doing. And, and that's it. And so you can't expect some 20 something first Lieutenant to buck that system. Somebody like me, this was an accidental career. I always sort of joked that I was okay to be fired at any moment. And though I didn't work like I'd been fired, I was certainly accused of it more than once. And I think I had, that was a benefit for me. That was an easy way for me to navigate in a way that they couldn't. It was easier for me to get in there and say, well, okay, if we're all good with them not getting the intel and not understanding the battle space, then okay, great. That's a great idea. And of course, no one wants to take responsibility once you say it in the obvious way. And I definitely had people who did not want to 
who did not want to deal with me because, because of that kind of stuff. And so it was a balance of how to navigate that, but it's a lot, it's a bigger ask for someone young in their career, young in their rank, young in this business. People told me once, you know, you have to play the game <laughs> so you can change the rules. And I thought that's fine mm -hmm. if no one's getting <laughs> Right. That's kind of where I landed. Well, there's, I think, several layers to why this dynamic exists. There's the layer that I was very familiar with and have talked about before, which is that men in, I mean, this can be true of women too, but I, I think it is just truer of men that, uh, and how they've been socialized or learned to be assertive or whatever, that men, once they make a decision, uh, see it as a sign of weakness to change their mind. And so part of being an effective rebel at work is, or, or you have a longer career as a successful rebel at work if you have a good sense of timing. So there are, no matter how true your perception is, there are wrong times to say it and wrong arenas to say it in. And um, so I think, you know, I think that, so you end up, if you say something, you end up flipping the table, you know, because you're asking those leaders to admit that their initial decision was flawed. And that's just, that's just really problematic. Another layer that occurs is one of different ideas as to what is the relevant information you need to make the decision. And I will quote someone, well, I won't say who it is, but someone I, I knew in uh, the national security field told me about the first time that he met with President Obama on some, you know, gritty issue of national security. And President Obama asked him a question like, uh, well, what do the women in the population think about this issue? For the guy I'm talking to, that it was totally out of left field. I mean, that might not have been the exact question, but it was, it was that kind of divergence. And and he said that in his time with President Obama, he felt that his um, uh, ability to see more broadly all the issues involved, all the perspectives that need to be considered, uh, expanded, and he and it was good for him. It was it was he ended up being, I think, a better policymaker. So you can have this thing of I've made my decision and I'm sticking with it. And you, in essence, for you to challenge that decision, you end up embarrassing, mm -hmm. potentially embarrassing that person. Yeah. Uh, and then the second one is that you may have a, a divergent, and but nevertheless really important view on what are the factors we need to consider before we move forward. And that is also unwelcome. I mean, that one might be a little easier than the other, you know, it's easier to say, well, I'm not sure that we've considered X. Yeah. It's harder to say, I don't think that's going to work. But, yes. Okay. I'm frustrated by this because why is it? Because I, of course, want to ask the why question. Why is it that we decide that it's problematic to tell a leader at the highest level that maybe their initial decision was not the right one? It, why, why do we train leaders um, to think that their job is to be right. Um, well, my and, answer and, to that, right? I mean, why do we do that? Yeah. Well, Lisa, why don't you go first? Cause you're our guest. I, I think that it's, it's a multi variable thing. I think that on the one hand, um, some people are told that leadership is about looking at a bunch of different potential things and choosing the right one. And I've heard people say that and thought, wow, and then there are leaders who are told, understand your weakness and surround yourself with the people whose strengths are the thing you do not have. And I mean, I had to be taught that. I, did, I wasn't military and I didn't have any leadership training. I legit was the 
you know, MFA walking into all of this and that slow move into that tactical world was terrifying. I had no idea what I was doing. I deferred to everyone. Like, and I think that's a distinction. I, I don't know that women are necessarily operate with more humility, but certainly when we're outnumbered in that, in that, in that big a, a ratio, I think that, that, that humility and deference uh, as a Southern woman, I always think about deference and, and I, and making sure that my deference is earned and also that is it's acknowledged. Like I'm deferring because I believe that your point is a good one, not not out of a sense of knowing my place. I think that is an alien concept to most men. Um, and I think that part of what people are taught as leaders is you're supposed to make these decisions. It's hard to be a leader, but you have to take responsibility. And when you say- when That's why they pay you the big bucks. Exactly. If I had a dollar for every time I heard that, right? <laughs> and then, or how many times I was told, you know, basically you're a green badge. If I, if I need you to make a decision, I'll recruit you over to this side. And at the end of the day, right, I think what that comes down to is if you say, I'm not sure if that's, the, and I did in the beginning, I'm sure I operated with far less tact than I should have and, a, and a, not a good understanding of that battle space. Once I understood it and got a little longer in the tooth, I think I could navigate it a little better by understanding if I say, have we considered this? This is this is the impact that I'm seeing at the ground level. There's no reason for you all to have been tracking that. That's you know my bad that we didn't think about this up front. If I come in with that deference immediately and give them the out, give them that that out, then it makes it much easier. But what I'm saying in the process is everyone between me and that person did not get that information to them. And so it's not just that person. It's everyone in that chain of command that you're sort of putting in that spotlight. Right. It's the whole system. So it you is. can't just say it's the problem of this person on top or the problem of the way that we we train leaders. It's the problem of the entire group that has agreed to behave in this way. And I get concerned when you talk about the deference because I think, um, I mean, I want to make the distinction. You clearly are making the distinction between being deferent when you do feel like the, that there's no more information to give and, and you agree that that this makes situation makes sense, but you're not being different when you stand up and you say, actually, I have some useful information here. And I think that's important to point out that distinction, because I think that a casual listener might think that what you're saying is you should just always be different, but it sounds like that's not what you're saying. Ooh, no, when anyone who knows me would laugh at this. <laughs> yeah, I, I do think that the, the humility and the deference is, an, is a really important part of leadership. And being able to have someone tell you, I had someone, a senior enlisted um, person came to me and said, what, what you just delivered there, I, I don't think that you meant to come off like this. And I respect you enough to tell you that this is how that came off. And I was mortified. And my gut reaction was to want to defend why I did that. And, and, but it stopped me short and, and I, I realized, okay, and I walked back in there in front of the group of people that I had said this to, and I went in and I said, I really appreciate that we have a relationship in here where we can, where we can, you know, throw a flag. And so I did not realize that when I said this, this is how this was coming off. This is what I actually intended, but I did that without really thinking about this consequence. So that is my mistake. Um, I apologize for that. I want to walk this back. Here's what I intended. What do you guys think? How do we do this? And I have never once had that backfire. I've never had somebody come up to me and say, you just weakened your authority. Like, I've, mm -hmm. you know, I think people respect when you do that, but that is a, I don't, I don't know if that's taught or not. I don't know if that has more to do with home training. I have no idea, but it, that, that deference is important on that level. But you work on collaboration. I mean, you train, you trained up a collaborative, essentially a system or a protocol for collaboration, not just train people to collaborate, but you kind of trained a protocol. Can you talk about how that all happened and how this feeds into that and read us your poetry? <laughs> well, yeah. I think at the, at the outset, I think the community at large, I mean, our community is a really fluid one. Um, you know, I think we talk a lot about how sort of brittle it is and how very, um, how very much we're sort of stuck in this sort of, you know, this McNamara era of things that the rules don't really apply here. And we certainly have lots of that. And at my level, 
Uh, again, Carmen has probably had to deal with just echelons of that, that I, I couldn't fathom that I would just want to scoop my eyes out of my head to have to see. But at the end of the day, I think part of what we recognize as a community is that one, you need more diversity of thought. You need more diversity of background. And the and, and I mean that in all the ways. Uh, and I mean what your what your subject matter expertise is, who you are as a person, gender, right, all, the whole the whole nine. I think we're headed in the right direction on that. But I think the big thing that that the community realized at some point was that we're really big. We're really, really big. There's a lot of people. And the DOD and the Intel community do not do a great job talking back and forth. And so once they started recognizing in a crisis, how do you know what's happening real time? And they were happening in these real time operational classified chat spaces. And so they realized there were certain people that were very adept at getting in those spaces and saying, hey folks, what do we know right now? What do we think it means? What's the Intel gap? What's the question we haven't answered? What, where do we think this is going? Can we concur? And you have thousands of people in these spaces and you have to build before the crisis that rapport and that idea, that functional space that says, I'm going to model this inclusive, informal behavior of saying, what do you think? And analysts hate that. Analysts do not like to say what they think. They want to say, here's what I, here's what I feel pretty sure about with whatever level of confidence and whatever you think of that system, right? The analysts if you say, what do you think to an analyst in a public forum, they feel like, well, I represent my agency. I don't want to say that thing. We had to really get everybody over the hump of saying, this is non-attribution. This is just asking you what you think. And then people start saying, well, the last time we had this lunar situation, this is what the Israelis did or whatever. They start talking about, here's what I think. And in a crisis, by that point, you've built something that feels like a community You've built things where people understand they can ask questions. You've built things where everything is sir or ma'am. Well, the people that I served with for 15 years still referred to me as ma'am or by my call sign every day. They never said, hey, Lise, what do you think? It was, it was always sir and ma'am. Everything was set up and modeled so that everyone understood these are the rules. This is how you do it. And because we did that, when we trained actual collaboration and facilitation SMEs, subject matter experts, we... We said, number one, the first rule is assume noble intent. That's that's a much bigger lift than it sounds like. And when you have, you know, 17, 18 agencies that are all fighting for their pots of money and want to take credit for the things, and you're saying everybody put it in the pot. It's a very communal thing we're asking for. It's a community lift. And you have all these things vying for attention and credit and that kind of thing. It was a it was a harder lift. Than, than it sounded like. So teaching that level of, again, humility, understanding that people in that room, 95, 98% are gonna lurk. They're not gonna be contributors. Right. Understanding how to manage that and how to pull people out and let them know it's a safe space to talk, curating those spaces before the crisis. So you weren't trying to figure it out with you know 5,000 people surging into a space. And that was, it was a lot of home training. I jokingly, just said, this is Southern home training. A lot of this is, you know, don't talk about things in a chat space that your mama told you don't talk about at the kitchen table, don't the dinner table, don't talk about religion, don't talk about politics, don't talk about these things. These are, sir or ma'am, respect to everybody, you know, defer to the people that are the experts in the room. If you're not sure what to do, ask one of us, act like a good host, you know, it was just it was a series of things like that. And then it was lots and lots of paperwork on understanding the metacognition of why it works and understanding the sociology of the spaces and why it works and why a bunch of green badge people are taking phone calls from the White House sit room or the NMCC at the Pentagon or whoever because they want to know what's going on and you appear to be in charge. It, mm -hmm. it was really, it was a great dynamic and a great success. It was one of those things that when it, when it, the funding went on that in 2021, you had, you know, dice like senior civilian general level people going, no, 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 this is going to be a problem in the community going, oh my God, oh my God. And so I, we've lost a lot of that in the last couple of years that I really hope that we'll, we'll get that back on a front burner. Sue Gordon was a huge supporter of this. Of course she was. Yeah. I, I mean, I got was it. Too. Was it real time? I, I imagine the answer is both. So you had real time collaboration and you had asynchronous 
uh, collaboration, right? Yes. And yes. Uh, talk about you. You just slightly mentioned it, but you know you have to create trust in in a group of people to uh, so that you perform at your best during a crisis. Yes. And I always thought, okay, when I when I was at CIA and I was really excited about chat rooms and blogs and, and all of the new digital social technologies, I I thought it was silly to say that everything had to be work related because right. you need a certain kind of banter right. and relaxation that creates trust. Yes. On the other hand, you had to protect yes. the boundary because I don't know what it is about people, but they just go sniffing on the other side of the fence, you know, really easily. Yes. Uh, so I just want to know, you know, I always thought banter, banter is one of my favorite words. Uh, I had a room people. called banter. Oh, for, did you? Oh, wow. Yeah. Our organization had a room called J the Joint Collaboration Cell, the JCC. Yeah. As soon as I saw it, I was like, Jewish community center, what are we doing? Uh, that's joint, what I collaboration, <laughs> joint collaboration cell. We had a room because I told them, and I, and I, it, it's a hard, it's a very, very hard thing. You have to tread this carefully in the, that you don't have the curation. Now we're losing some of that subject matter expert yes. folks, because they're, they're seeing this speculation and banter that it goes on and on. And there's no one to go, Hey, thank you. You guys need to take that conversation offline. So part of what we had to we had to model the behavior, which meant that That's when I exactly came in right. in the morning, the senior that I worked with, a man named Myron Stevenson and a guy named Jim Holt went by Jolt and Collab Man was Myron's handle. And he he was there from, oh my gosh, he was there for 20 years. And they were the people when I got in there, morning, sir, morning, ma'am, how's it going? Hey, KC, my call sign is Kill Chain. So I got called KC quite a bit. So they'd say, hey, KC, I'm seeing this is going on over here in Darzar. What do you know about this? And it was both an invitation for me to share some information. We would call that catnipping so that we could throw something in that people would want and get to scurry back with, and then also start having that conversation. And some of that was built in. It was banter, but it was still, it was still mission related. Yeah. And then other points we would have just a little bit, Hey, listen, we're not, there's not such a, fast pace in here right now. How's everybody doing? Yeah. It built in that conversation that people were willing to say, Hey, it's, you know, it's pouring rain over here or yeah, I'm snowed in over here. Hey, we're out in Kandahar and this is what we're seeing and being able to do that. And then knowing that all you had to say was, Hey, this has been great. Listen, let's, let's move it, move the needle back a minute here. And our rule was that if you were looking at a screen and the entire screen was banter, it's probably a good time. Yeah. Say, that's, hey, that's, is, that's actually that's a great a physical cue like that that's absolutely that's awesome. yeah, and I'd absolutely. always reach out to the people that were the last ones that spoke I would reach out in a direct message and just say hey wanted to be clear not cutting you off in any manner really appreciate everyone and that's I jokingly refer when I train people on collaboration still I I, I just jokingly refer to it as the drunk dial like I will pick up a phone and call anybody I don't know for, for the purpose of just saying, hey, I just wanted to say, I really appreciate the stuff that you put in this room every day. I'm Lisa, this is what I do. What do you do over there? I'm really curious about this. And I, every single one of those calls always resulted in some touch point that I could go, oh, okay, great. And that is how you build a coalition of the willing when you have communities that are not funded to do this. Right. Collaboration right. is not a funded thing anymore. And the, right. what they it's call collaboration so sad. Is, yeah. Is not, yeah, yeah. Sue was no, yeah. Collaboration is not deconfliction. Um it is not. And it is not <laughs> it is not coordination and it is not it's exactly. It's yeah. Sue well, Sue really got that. She was a great proponent of that. I okay. I legitimately cried real tears when she resigned. I was like, uh, oh my God, because she just she was so wonderful and she got this. She was looking to have this codified and resourced at ODI okay. before she so yeah, she, there are some that have gotten it, but the yeah. stuff you're talking about, especially this, what Carmen, what you just said, uh, that collaboration is not just the opposite of, or is not deconfliction. It's not, I mean, it's not the opposite of deconfliction. It's, not, it's on the but spectrum, but like. Deconfliction is what you end up doing when you haven't effectively collaborated. Well, so yeah, and deconfliction is a checkbox thing. We're yeah. the anti-checklist checklist. That's what collaboration is. It's a, yeah. it is done with, you know, when I trained national facilitators, I would tell them this is a trade craft. 
Do not refer to this as magic. Do not refer to this as mm. pixie dust. Do not refer to this as soft skills. That is that is how we end up with people not funding something that the exactly. whole community says is exactly. critical. You can't do that. You have to recognize it's a tradecraft. And the tradecraft is understanding why is this effective? Why does this work in this space? Why doesn't, if you have a problem, if you have people that are routinely just waiting to make a snarky remark, those are the people you want to talk to and say, hey, you know, not sure you know that you're coming off like this, but how about you put some nuggets in here other than just, you know, the kind of stuff, you know, and and it's that sort of tradecraft of understanding how to navigate it and understanding that it is an anti-checklist. I expect my facilitators every day when they're coming in to be looking at all the spaces, keeping situational awareness on hundreds and hundreds of chat rooms. And we've built technology that helps us with that. And even as a Luddite, like I understand I, my keyword searches and pings and subscriptions and things that help. The NRO is the absolute best in the community at these tools. So we were well positioned to kind of take that technology and then build a trade craft of behavior around it. And, and it was, you know, force multiplying. I hate that term, but it, it truly was like orders of magnitude shift and how we could do things in real time. The deconfliction, military is great at that. We're we're in an we're in an industry that's really good at deconflict. We're yep. not in an industry that's good at collaboration. Love. I mean, it seems to me that what you're talking about is weaving in this sort of quiet, empathic. I mean, you're an empath big time, and you're a poet, which mm -hmm. I would like to reassert that I demand that you read your poetry to us because it's so amazing. And and you come in here with your MFA, and you're like, let's be people, and. And the, the idea of being people is a radical one. That's like a rebellious idea, even though, of course, everyone's a person, right? So it's kind of weird. So so in what way do you, it seems like you're using love to bind people in some kind of way. Am I making that up because I'm so focused on love or is that a real thing? No, I mean, I'm very, my in fact, my, my partner at work, Brian Bush, he's a great guy. He's a super subject matter expert and he's a real text me, tools me. And he jokes that I'm his Luddite pet, that he has to constantly <laughs> fix my technology and all the tools I break. And he and he will constantly say, I do the tools and Parker does all the peoply things. And I like the peoply things because I like, I like those, I like those relational transactions. I want to know somebody. I remember I went to a major that I was working for once and I said, I don't know if I'm doing something wrong because I just spent, you know, eight hours of my 12 hour shift all night on a sipper private chat room with a sailor who's forward deployed and this is his first deployment and they just lost somebody. And the entire conversation all day was just like, I had that dream again and I'm really having a hard time. And what's the weather like? Who won the game? Mm. What, what are you eating today? And I told him, I said, this, and he said, hey, guess what, Parker? This is all part of it. This is a trust that you're building with these people and that's it. And so if you did nothing else all day, but to talk this guy off the, not off the ledge, but if you did nothing, but remind him that it's okay. And there's somebody there that he can talk to you about that, then that's fine. And that was the most freeing thing for me because I thought, am I a fraud? Like, I, I don't know all the tactical lingo yet. Am I just going on this soft skill people-y thing? Like, am I, and it really, it took him saying, Mm, that's a real thing. That guy's going to be able to function and do the thing he's supposed to and provide whatever he has to for his teammates and keep them safe. Like that's a real part of that. And that was where I, that was the moment at which I realized. And he was the guy that stood all of that up. And he was somebody that was big hearted and just wanted everybody to understand there's a place for absolutely everybody at this table. We just have to figure out what it is and that's on us. And that was a huge thing. Like that love of you know, you know, it's basic stuff. It's your love of country. It's your love of family who you want to be safe and friends and it's mission. And when you're in the trenches with people forward or back here, having to see really hard things you can't unseat, that is a bond. That is a fierce bond. I'm friends with people in the last 20 years that I will never not be friends with. I could call people I haven't seen in 10 years and say help, and they would be on the first plane out here. That is an intense love and an intense relationship that I think everybody recognizes on some level is a part of why you put up with the bullshit. It's why you put up with bad leadership or 
bad resources or having to maintain a clearance and all the stuff that comes with that. You know, it, it's why you put up with old systems and things that are hard, you know? It's why you put up with, you know, not being able to travel without telling security where you're going and who you're meeting with. And you do that because that relationship is is deep and abiding. And it's something that it's hard to walk away from. I've tried. I've twice tried to walk away from this community and could not could not do it. You know, after the Afghanistan evacuation, mm. I, I cannot. I cannot. This was such a top to bottom train wreck and these people that were so anguished, my colleagues who were anguished, people forward, I, it just, it was too much. I mean, I, my mind was just turned inside out and I was closing out this whole collaboration thing at the exact same time. And I just said, that's it, man, I need time. And I, I spent four months off contract, just fishing with my dad and sitting on the porch with the dog and still working on getting people out of Afghanistan on my laptop. But like that, I tried, I really thought I, I got to get out. Like I can't, I don't want to keep doing this. And it was the people inside the wire that called and said, don't go out like that. We got a gig here, come back and do this. And if you don't like it, then go back to academia, go back to doing something else. But so you know. I, um, I, I hear everything you're saying. Um, I feel everything you're saying. I'll bet. So I want to ask you, uh, kind of perhaps as a lead in to, uh, reading your poetry. <laughs> uh, and you know as usual we we took we do these totally unrehearsed so you don't know the question that i'm going to ask you but it is no. <laughs> what were you doing at the metropolitan opera by the way so um nothing sexy and nothing even i'm a musician it was nothing musical i was working for the general counsel uh, i had worked oh. in law firms for years um and and it was an absolutely horrible job horrible job just yeah. well, anyway, but you had an FFA, you had an MFA. Yes, I did. You have an MFA. I do. So my question is, what something along the like along the lines of, but you can refashion this question. What did you what what principles, for example, would DOD benefit from that would come out of the fine arts? Or you turn that, you know, you can kind of vector that question however you want, you know, or like the principles that I learned in fine arts that really worked in DOD or any way that you want to kind of, but I'm just trying to get that kind of, uh, that interesting that free song between the two <laughs> of fields. So, uh, what, what would you say to that? Yeah, I will tell you that oddly enough or not, I have met probably at least a dozen other MFAs. And those are just people I met randomly, um, musicians mostly. And then some were, I met a sculptor. I can't remember anyway, but I, I think the thing that certainly I find useful, one, attention to detail. As a poet, it's all about the details. It's about small details. So I notice, I notice details. Um, Sometimes the great big things, broad brush things will go right by me, but I'll get the little things. Um, and I think that matters. I do think that artistic sensitivity is a real thing. It's <clears throat> beyond the stereotype. Most artists are empaths. And I think that that matters to being in a, a business that's built to be hard where you necessarily, I mean, I was a medic for 15 years. I learned how to compartmentalize things, but I think that you can't, you really atrophy as a person and as an as a group if you operate like that. And I think having more empathic people who both pay attention to the peopley things, who understand relations, who understand um, patterns, the musicians especially, oh, understand, yeah. understanding patterns and cadence of things. It makes us, generally speaking, better communicators, better speakers. And that is something that is woefully um, not hard to find, I guess, but it's, it's not as prevalent as you would like. So those, those key expressive skills are, I think, I think those are the, the biggest things I would say that someone with an arts degree is going to, is going to come with. Great. Not through everybody, but I think most, most people and, and the empathy, I just think is you need more of that. Yep. So are you willing to read a poem? <laughs> what do you what would you like to hear <laughs> well what do you what do you think of like in this conversation what what 
poem comes to mind? Um, you know, I, I had these poems that I was trying to, I find it very hard to, when you're doing something, when it's something really huge that you're trying to get your head around, it's really, really hard. Um, I think to write something, it's extremely hard to find a way to that point. And so I tended to write these bigger, um, bigger things like longer poems that kind of <laughs> that got really long winded. And one of the things that I found was, was easier to wrestle to the ground was when I, I would start doing these shorter, um, pieces. And so, um, one of the things I'm just trying, I'm trying to find this as I'm, and now I can't see either one of you at all. So it's okay. Just keep looking. Who are, okay. who, who are your favorite poets? Oh my gosh. Well, I love Mary Oliver. I, well, I kind of thought you were going to say that. But. I love Mary Oliver. I'm such a nature freak. I, yes. everything about her. I just love everything about her and, um, wonderful Appalachian poets. I'm Appalachian. So, um, Jane Hicks, Morris Manning, Bill Brown, um, uh, just a list of people I I absolutely adore. Wow. Um, uh, well, we have so, to talk sometime about the Appalachian, your Appalachian roots and how it keys into your intuition and empathic ability, because I think it's right there. Oh yeah, absolutely. I come from a long line of oh, Kentucky, of, Tennessee, North Carolina. Oh, the Southwestern part of Virginia, right on the border of Kentucky. Oh, right there. Yeah. 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 Right in Buckhannon County is where my people are from. They're all coal miners and um, so yeah, I, and it's, you know, we got raised, I was the first generation raised above the poverty line. And so I was the first, um, raised outside the hollers. We were, you know, we were raised out in Falkier County down the road from, from, from here in Northern Virginia. And, but we grew up in that culture and with that language and dialect and music and storytelling and all of that. So yeah, it was a huge, it's a huge part of who I am. Um, and it is a central part of who I am as a writer, so um not not quite uh Appalachian, but are you familiar with Flannery O'Connor? Oh my goodness, uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm a southern I'm a southern I girl. Knew, I knew. <laughs> so, you know, her famous collection of short stories and her from most famous short story, I think, is a good man is hard to find. Mm -hmm. And there's a musician who has uh, uh was getting his PhD in Flannery O'Connor and uh created a whole album of music inspired by Fl Flannery O'Connor. And uh, I'll send you the link. Uh, and the one song uh, that I've heard is, a good man is hard to find, but a, ma a bad man's easy. And <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Flannery O'Connor is the best at, she was the one that said, you know, Southern women are Mack trucks disguised as powder puffs. Yes, yes. She's full of that stuff. I yeah, had, I had, I mean, we could do a whole other conversation on this. I had real trouble with Flannery O'Connor yeah. until I read someone, or maybe she herself was described. Oh, no, she was very fond of a critic who said that reading Flannery O'Connor is like reading the Old Testament. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I understand now. <laughs> and uh, and then I read her letters, her correspondence, which yeah. is which is fantastic. Yeah, I, she's she's amazing. The I, I refer to her as the modern day Flannery O'Connor because she's amazing. Um, the author, Lee Smith, she's a, a novelist and and short story writer. And Lee, Lee Smith, she's wonderful. And she's from Buchanan County. Um, yeah, she's a New York Times bestselling novelist. I mean, she's, I her. she's, yeah. she's fantastic. And I look at her like a modern day Flannery. I mean, she just, she's so funny. She's, she's gritty and wonderful. Um, Silas House, who's a good friend of mine. He's a Kentucky, he's currently the Kentucky Poet Laureate, but he's mm. a novelist also. He's, he's had a bunch of New York Times bestselling novels and he's done very, very well for himself. And we have these great conversations about about you know the canon of like what what is current Appalachian and Southern literature you know what what does that look like now right, you know, yeah. Flannery and Will, you know Faulkner and all these people that are that are always going to be part of that canon what is this move into into modern uh, modern novels and modern poets and who's in that and what do they look like and okay but let's hear some Lisa Parker because I hear she's <laughs> yeah. great I know. <laughs> 
All right. Well, let's see. Uh, this one, um, this one I actually wrote recently just, and again, it was like trying to wrestle something so huge down to the page that I just really, really got it pared down to just the smallest thing I could. Um, so this is called uh, Hamid Karzai International Airport, Kabul, mm. August 2021. When it's clear we won't take any more allies to safety inside the gates, parents begin to throw babies wrapped tightly in blankets, so brightly colored, hurled over concertina wire, fuchsia blurs as bright as zinnias, suddenly airborne against the brown background. And we watch the desperate lunges of Marines on the other side, their weapons thrown down as they pitch forward, their eyes focused only on the everything falling toward them. Wow. Now this one, Carmen, I wanted to read because when I first saw the link on LinkedIn and you all were talking about awe, mm. I just thought, you know, I love this woman. Look at her talking about all in this way. And to have been a senior in the Intel community talking about how you love to be awed, just like that was where I started watching this with devotion and saying, okay, this is a great intersection between these two women. Um, and so I ended up writing this poem about that. And this is just called Mystery. And it starts with a quote that you said during that podcast. We humans, I think, at least for now, are fated to live in a universe that we don't understand. So that, to me, is such an interesting condition to be in. And I also believe in awe. I awe. I want to be awed. Carmen Medina. Mary Oliver said, beauty can both shout and whisper, and still it explains nothing. With age, I'm more good with that than not. The older I get, the less I need the explanations and theories. I'd rather watch the unnamed spider at the center of its masterpiece and say to it simply, good job you, than to understand tensile strength or the geometric probability of a meal caught in its sticky perfection. Because always, always is the stray sunlight glint that gives away the surprise a last minute steer clear of a moth or beetle duly warned, or the gust of sudden wind that sends that rough hickory leaf on thermals to pierce the whole delicate balance of things. Ah, very nice. <laughs> very <laughs> powerful. Oh, good. Thank very you. powerful. And if I can read one more, Carmen, I wanted to read this because Yay. you've talked so much about your grandmother. Oh, I love, and I just love that. And I, my grandma was just my heart. She, and she was, she was that mountain seer that I was telling you about yeah. Julia and just amazing. And, she, you know, did not have it easy and lost children along the way. And was just this fierce, sweet, um, just curious woman. And everything we did, of course, was, was just walking on water and, she thought we were so amazing. And when I went to grad school to get my MFA, I was up in at Penn State and I'd let, I'd never lived outside the South and I'd never, I'd never, I did never experienced what it is to have a Southern accent someplace else in the country and just the condescension and the, the mess that went with that. And I remember talking to her, trying to talk to her about this and realizing that it was so hard to relate that. Um, and so I, I ended up writing this poem and Lee Smith the novelist, when I was at a workshop with her that, that summer, I told her, I said, you know, these, these people just drop my IQ 15 points as soon as they hear my voice. And I said, it's so insulting. And I'm so done. I just don't even want to go back. And she said, oh, hell honey. She said, no, you need to let, let them think you're stupid and take them out at the knees. And she said, go back there and write about every damn thing you love. <laughs> I thought, well, okay. And this was the first thing I wrote and it ended up winning this huge prize um, this prestigious thing where, you know, suddenly my English department recognized me as a person and not just, you know, that hillbilly. And it, it was life changing. And it ended up in all of these college literature anthologies. <laughs> so I still see the dividends from this all the time. And my grandma got such a kick out of this because it's about her. And I would tell her, I would, I'd bring her these giant literature anthologies and say, yeah, um, that's about you. Like we would read it together. And she'd say, well, how come I ain't seen no money at that? You know, she <laughs> jokes about it, but she absolutely loved it. 
So um, I just, I think, I think our grandmas are just the best. And so yeah, this absolutely. is the poem I wrote about my grandmother. This is called Snapping Beans for Faye Witt. I snapped beans into the silver bowl that sat on the splintering slats of the porch swing between my grandma and me. I was home for the weekend, from school, from the north. Grandma hummed, what a friend we have in Jesus, as the sun rose, pushing its pink spikes through the slant of corn stalks, through the fly-eyed mesh of the screen. We didn't speak until the sun overcame the feathered tips of the cornfield and grandma stopped humming. I could feel the soft gray of her stare against the side of my face when she asked, how's school going? I wanted to tell her about my classes, the revelations by book and lecture, as real as any shout of faith, potent as a swig of strychnine. She reached the leather of her hand over the bowl and cupped my quivering chin. The slick smooth of her palm held my face the way she held cherry tomatoes under the spigot careful not to drop them. And I wanted to tell her about the nights I cried into the familiar heartsick panels of the quilt she made me, wishing myself home on the evening star. I wanted to tell her the evening star was a planet, that my friends wore nose rings and wrote poetry about sex, about alcoholism, about Buddha. I wanted to tell her how my stomach burned acidic holes at the thought of speaking in class, speaking in an accent, speaking out of turn how I was tearing, splitting myself apart with the slow simmering guilt of being happy despite it all. I said, school's fine. We stapped beans into the silver bowl between us and when a hickory leaf, still summer green, skidded onto the porch front, grandma said, it's funny how things blow loose like that. Hmm. Wow, that's, that's really fantastic. Thank you. So that's the poetry. <laughs> yeah, that's beautiful. Do you, still, still, do you still engage in poetry or? Yeah. Yeah. It Absolutely. Does. Yeah. In fact, I will be with another poet whose third book just came out, Jane Hicks. I'll be with her on um, New Year's weekend. We'll be doing some writing. I still teach at workshops and give readings. My My second book just came out last November, so I'm still kind of going around giving readings and things like that which I love it you know it makes me just as big a weirdo to those people that I work in defense as it makes me a weirdo in the defense to be yeah honest. right yeah I, I like it link. I'm comfortable <laughs> can you give us a link to that event just so that people yeah know? absolutely That'd which is, nice. is it your the poetry you just mentioned Oh, I don't have anything lined up right now. I'm literally just going to hang out with another poet and do you're some just oh, workshopping with like her. Yeah, with yeah, but I absolutely like... the the minute I have something. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Do you have a particular song you'd like to should dance to? So I have an impinged nerve in my lower back, which means I can't should dance to anything. I will be slowly okay. rising from the chair at the okay. end. Of the show. Okay, I think I think poetry is like two shadances. I, I, I think know. each poem was a shadance. I feel yes, like we should exactly. dance three times. Absolutely. Right. There okay. you go. Yes. Fantastic. <laughs> oh my gosh. Wow. What oh. a what a fantastic, fantastic conversation. Oh, I got to tell you, Carmen, I have been, it's so funny. I, Julie and I shut the restaurant down the first night we met. We just sat <laughs> there talking and talking. They're like, they're like putting the chairs up. And they were. Like, like, so okay. <laughs> a good Southern girl me was like, oh my Lord, like we got to get out of here. But, but, and truly like, I have so looked forward to this, Carmen, I, because you have just been like this, this role model from a distance and I my my good friend Sharon Messina Major Messina had met with yes, you yes right and, yeah, and she that's right like, she's exactly what you think she is she's wonderful and you know you guys got to talk sometimes so uh just we gotta we gotta nosh we gotta do more than just please, talk we gotta nosh. please love to nosh I will bring some okay I, I'm in Texas here. right now so I, I I have my uh non-east coast non-dc um experience you know where i winter in texas it's very healthy yes that sounds right yeah yeah that's... very healthy well if i get to texas or you head back this direction yeah we'll, absolutely we'll not yeah. we'll <laughs> nosh all right so just to say uh that it'll probably be a few days before you see this one posted because we just posted one 
I know. I can't wait to watch that. I'm very excited. And, and we, you know, we have a couple more, like we post it and then we do excerpts and then, so I, I'm, well, thinking, I'm thinking we'll post it before the end of the year. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe we could, maybe next week. Yeah. At some point, but it'll, they'll just clump up if we try to, and this one is so good. I'm just really Really and your happy. poetry makes me cry every time. I know, I've got tears in my eyes. I, I appreciate that so much. And I feel I feel like I can't believe this went by so quickly. I feel like, yeah. my God, was I the only one talking? I feel like I've just talked the paint off the walls. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's such a great expression. And I hope Absolutely. that you did. <laughs> well, I'm off to play, uh, I got to say this, I'm off to play pickleball in about an hour. Nice. And one of the, it's in Texas. And there's, you know, 15, 20 of us who show up, you know, either you know oh, not all the time but and what i find so interesting is not there and i've been doing it for six months nobody ever talks about anything associated with work there has never in this whole time six months and oftentimes you know there's more of us than can play at any one time so we're sitting you know chatting waiting for our turn not a single nobody knows anything i don't know anything about anybody else that's professional and i'm like thinking hooray you know <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> i can't think of any scenario that wouldn't include that even just it, in common banter yeah, yeah exactly but not nothing i mean that, <laughs> nothing and i'm like wow i wonder how long this is going to go on like, like, i love that how freeing i, I love it that's fantastic you need the place you need the place to go where work is not the thing yeah exactly yeah. oh yeah i think that has been having you know all the poetry and musician and photographer all the things that are the creative side of my life i swear has is the only reason i've lasted this long in the intel community there'd be no mm. way of mm. balancing that mental health <laughs> if i did not have that as an outlet yeah, and, yeah gotta right. have it yeah um, and what i think is so sad uh in the intelligence community is that there's so many people who don't recognize that their mental health is at risk. They, I mean, they just don't even, it's not even part of their consciousness. No. It's usually when the mental health is not at risk, it's in fact impacted and yet, already. And yet it is, you know, when they retire yeah. and they can't figure out what to do and then they start drinking because that's yeah. a big, you know. The, the identity tied up in this is a really particular thing, even for people that aren't in uniform and getting out, which is its yes. own thing, you know, but watching that. And I tell you, the, the end of the Afghan, the mm. pulling out of Afghanistan to begin with, I remember talking to people about this. I was like, this is going to be such an identity crisis for people of, of you know, at my 20 years in who have, that's been the thing you were dealing with the entire time. And then the manner in which it went down mm -hmm. and the way that we pulled out and all the people that were left and all the, you know, and there's so much blame across the board, across administrations. Like it just, it, and I don't say that as a, you know, these, this particular group, but it was so bad. It was such a mind screw and all of us trying to get people out. And I just remember thinking, and, and a Marine actually said to me, he was putting together these lists that they were prioritizing these lists of hundreds of people who were sending desperate pictures of themselves and their children at the gates saying, get me out. Here's the thing, you know, and I was trying to navigate this and run this to ground. And I, this Marine said to me, these lists that we're putting together, we're deciding who is prioritized to get in there. And he said, they're referring to these fucking things as Schindler's lists. And he said, oh we're, he said, we're never going to recover from this. Those of us having to do this. And oh. they're the people that, and most of them have gotten out in the last couple of years. And they're the ones that I routinely check on. We were all paying each other. I had general officers reaching out just like, Hey, Parker, are you good? I'm like, Nope. How are you? You know, it was this for you. Oh God. Yeah. I mean, the, I will say, I think following that, there was a lot of conversation. I instigated a lot of that conversation in chat rooms and saying, cause people would, it got a little inappropriate. Like what the hell are they doing? And where's state department? It was a lot of that kind of stuff. And I would have to say, Hey guys, we are all on the same painful page here. Let's, let's remember we're on this system for a purpose. And then let's have these conversations offline and let's have these conversations. You know, we had people at the state department that were like, they're bringing in therapy dogs. Like this is, this is just catastrophic for everybody. And I think that helped our community actually have that conversation. Yeah. Because nobody, if you were involved, 
if you lost people over there, if you were over there, if you'd fought and bled and, 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 or just been involved for a couple decades and, and then you're watching it go down and people falling off landing gear and just all of it, 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 it was the thing that opened that door more than anything I've ever seen to have those discussions about mental health. So, and that's the silver lining of that. I never heard people talk about it. There was no balance for a lot of people. It was Lisa, I think you've saved people's lives by talking about it, by saying, no, I'm not okay. And modeling that. I think we all have. Well, I, no, I, I haven't. So I'm pretty sure that you have. I, I think there's <laughs> there, were, there were numerous people who I think were having those conversations. I did have somebody contact me and say, somebody wanted you to make sure you knew where the EAP, where the employee assistance <laughs> program was. And I was like, no, I mean, do I need to worry about this, that we're having these conversations? You know, clearance is a a hard thing to navigate because there's a balance between getting in a bullseye of something you don't mean to and be looked at for something and being able to say, yeah, I'm not okay right now. This is why, and this is what we're dealing with. So it's, this it's is a, a good time to let, just let you know that we'll put, put it privately on YouTube and then let you listen to it. Yeah. And then you can decide what parts you don't want to include and we'll anything we've talked about we'll completely I'm respect that. I'm fine with anything we've talked about. I don't, I've not said anything that I'd be like, oh God, I wish I hadn't. But it brings up another topic. I would love to have another conversation about navigating mental health when part of your clearance is predicated on this idea that you can't have any mental health problems. That's an old, that's an old idea. Yeah. It still still has uh, residual strength. In yeah. the intelligence community, both because some people believe it and then because other people, you know, like managers might believe it, but it, it's, you know, it, it is, it's way better than it was when I joined. Uh, I'm sure that's true. 44 years ago. <laughs> I so want to just, I so just want to hear the stories and pick your brain sometime. Uh, well, we should do that conversation. Like just yeah. Carmen tell stories. Okay. Listen. Yes. <laughs> Right. I, I I do keep a a, a little a digital file of the most ridiculous things that ever happened to me at CIA, and I I every once in a while I'll remember one and I add it to the list. Uh, but I don't know how many of those I can go public with. Oh yeah, I I I get you. I I think just knowing how you navigated all of that is fascinating. You know, it's a it's hard it's hard as a woman in this in this business period, but it's especially hard when you have influence or power or authority of some kind, um, that bullseye gets, gets pretty sharp. That little tracer gets pretty specific and it's, it's hard to let go of that sense of defensiveness. And, and I, I just, I, and, and it's, I'm sure it's much easier now for me than it was when you were coming through there. I'm sure there were a lot less women and certainly at your rank, the things that you have seen, and I'm sure that Sue has seen. And oh yeah, I mean, well, she's there. Why that things have been easier for you in that respect? I mean, they're they're proud of why. I'm, I'm standing on their shoulders a thousand percent, absolutely. And and Sue was that person that was like, oh my god, you're an MFA. How wonderful! I have a zoology degree. <laughs> <laughs> just looked at her and was like, are you real? This is so great. Yeah. She was wonderful. I, I, I really, the community is a lesser place without Sue Gordon in it. I really miss her. You can just see behind me the, the final moments of the setting sun. Yeah. Uh, illuminating the white, the bright white. Oh, that's sun. so nice. Isn't that nice? Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. I'm in a hotel room. There's, there was no good angle for anything. <laughs> Oh, it was really nice. We saw the sunset before. It was beautiful. Oh, good. Yeah. good. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And that teen guy did not come back up with his loud muffler car. He was doing like back and forth, back and forth. And I thought, where am I going to go if I can't do this here? I, so I know that you two me. need to have like your own, um, you know, private sort of classified conversation. But at some point, you know, assuming I continue not to have a security clearance, I still want to have a meeting with the three of us where we all just hang out and go to union or something oh, yeah. and uh, just talk. Yep. Yeah, this was wonderful. This all was- right. Well, stay well. Merry Christmas. Merry Happy Christmas. Holidays. Happy Hanukkah. Happy holidays. Thank you. Thank you. Take Thanks. care. See you, Julia. Bye, Carmen. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.